Keon Henderson is founder, CEO, and senior pastor of the Lighthouse Church and Ministries, a church community headquartered in Houston, Texas. With more than 20 years in active ministry and speaking for thousands worldwide, Pastor Henderson is a formidable thought leader. His first book, The Shift, Courageously Moving from Season to Season, has inspired people of all genres and backgrounds to face life's challenging stages with tools, courage, and purpose. Founded in 2009, the Lighthouse Church encompasses five campuses and 30 ministries as of one of the fastest growing churches in the nation with over 15,000 members and climbing, welcoming 800,000 unique weekly viewers worldwide. Pastor Henderson has been commended as a true servant leader, recognized as a CNN Heroes Award nominee, helping disaster aid initiatives both locally and internationally. He is originally from Gary, Indiana, the husband to Shawnee Henderson, and the father of one beloved daughter. Please stand and welcome Pastor Keon Henderson. On tonight, Genesis 26, verse 1 through 4. If you got it, say, I got it. If you still look and say, hold up. Now, this is Genesis Church. First one. Genesis 26, verse number 1. And the Bible says there was a famine in the land subsequent to the earlier famine that occurred in the days of Abraham. Isaac went to Abimelech, king of the Philistines. The Lord appeared to Isaac and said, do not go down to Egypt. Settle down in the land that I will point out to you and stay in this land. Then I will be with you and bless you for I will give all of these lands to you and to your descendants and I will fulfill the oath that I promised your father Abraham. I will multiply your descendants so they will be as numerous as the stars in the sky and I will give them all the lands, all the nations of the earth will pronounce blessings on one another using the name of your descendants. That's verse 1 through 4. Go down to verse 12 through 14. The Bible says, when Isaac planted in that land, he reaped in the same year a hundred times what he had sown because the Lord blessed him. And the man became wealthy. His influence continued to grow until he became prominent, verse 14. And he had so many sheep and cattle and such a great household of servants that the Philistines were jealous of him. But you look in the beginning when I just started reading, he was in a famine. By the time we get to verse 14, he's so wealthy he can't count it. Now, I don't know who this word is for, but I know God gave me this word, and I want you to help me preach it. Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, it may not feel like it. You may not know what's happening, but God told me to tell you that if you will stay faithful, you will discover that you are on the edge of evidence. That, that's what I want to talk about tonight. The edge of evidence. Y'all praise God for Pastor Mitch Summerfield who's in the place today. God bless you, my brother. There is, there is a term, there is a term uh, in legal recourse called corpus delecti rule. Um, and corpus uh, delecti says that there has to be sufficient evidence in order for you to be convicted of a crime. You, you cannot be convicted of a crime according to the delecti rule, even if you confess to it, if there is no evidence. Watch this. So, so I can go right into the police station right now. The latest crime that just happened, I can walk right in and say, that bank that was robbed, I did it. And if there is no sufficient evidence, they cannot convict me whether I did it or not. Are y'all with me? 
So, so it's, it's, it's the same in larceny. If, if I say I stole something, but they cannot prove that I stole it, they can't convict me based on my admission because it isn't the admission that gets me put into prison. It's the evidence. Does that make sense to you? So if, if you bring over somebody to your house and, and they start cooking and they burn the house down, they can't be convicted of arson. They just made a mistake. Because if criminal intent is not discovered, then it is an insurance claim, but it is not a crime because you cannot be convicted of something where there isn't substantial evidence that supports the crime. Are you listening to me? That's, that's the corpus rule. That's the delecti rule, that you cannot be found guilty unless there is substantial evidence. Now, the Latin word, uh, evidentia, it means proof. Uh, it means... Uh, in the classic Latin distinction, it means, it means vivid presentation. Stay with me. We're going somewhere. It, it means clearness. Everybody say clearness. The stem of the Latin evidens means obvious and apparent. And so when the word was first mentioned in the 14th century, over 700 years ago, it actually meant grounds for belief. It meant grounds for belief. Belief. What am I saying? Why am I going uh, through this multisyllabic exercise? Why am I talking to you about words stemming from the 14th century and we are now in the 21st century? What is the significant uh, pendulum and bridge that connects what was to what is? It's simply me telling you that without evidence, you cannot be convicted. Are you listening to me? Which means that a prosecutor cannot obtain a trial if there is no evidence that you are guilty. Now, the problem is, is most of us in here know we're guilty. We just can't yet figure out how we got off. But I wonder, I wonder how have you been able to do what you've done in your life and yet every time the devil tries to vex you, he misses his target. I'm trying to figure out why is it that in this season, cancer is about to skip a generation? And what is it that you are doing or what did your mother do? Because you have to know that the devil has been after you all of your life. Why hasn't he been able to get the charges to stick? Because God hid the evidence. And he covered it by the blood of Jesus. You know, once in a while I get this revelation of all of the people who come to church who are struggling with life. And the Lord gave me this revelation that when a man meets a woman and they conceive a child, 33 million sperm cells are released. All 29, or I should say 32,999,000 die, one survives. One survives. That means that you are the one that survived, which means if you can survive birth, you ought to be able to handle life. J just touch three people and say, I can handle this. I can handle this. I can handle this. I don't care what the devil is doing. I can handle this. I don't care if I lose this job. I can handle this. If you decide you don't want to be in this relationship, I might cry, but I can handle this. If they come get the car and I got an Uber, I, I can handle this. If, if, I, if I lose it all, I, can, I don't want to, but if I do, just touch three people and say, I can handle this. I, I can handle this. I can, I can handle this. Now, let's, let's put that over here. Now let's take a quantum leap into the text, because as we look into the text, there is a young man who is mentioned. His name is Isaac. Isaac is one of the big three in the patriarchal dynasty. There is Abraham, there is Isaac, and there is Jacob. At least 30 times the Bible says that he is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. At least 30 times we see Isaac and Jacob in the same sentence. And no, they are not acquaintances. They are kin. For one is the grandfather, one is the father, and one is the son. 
it is a picture of the Trinity, for there is one Lord, one faith, and one baptism. There is, watch this, now the father Abraham has been told by God, I will bless you as multiple as the stars are in the sky. And when you go to the beach, I will have so many blessings for you, it will be like trying to count the sand individually. Abraham dies and doesn't see what God said. But now Isaac is in the picture and he's about to get a glimpse of what God promised his father. The problem is, is that the land that God is talking about when his father was alive, it was flowing with milk and honey. And now that it is in his possession, the Bible says that there is a famine in the land. What do you do when God promised you something that's dried up when you get it? And I'm, I'm not talking about, I'm talking about the idea that when I looked at it, when it was my daddy's, it was working. Why did it dry up when it was my season? When it was somebody else's opportunity, it seemed like money was everywhere. And now it's my turn and the government is going to change. Now that it's my turn, they don't have respect for the leadership position that I have. Now that it's my turn, things are drying up. But I came to tell somebody, be not weary in your well-doing, for you will reap a harvest if you faint not. Do me a favor, tell your neighbor say neighbor I didn't drive all the way over here and sit next to you for you to be sitting here looking ashy and ain't gonna say nothing at all I, I, I need I need a praise partner now if you don't have nothing to say you can get up and go sit in the balcony but I need somebody by me that understands that they're on the edge of evidence can I just get about five people to do a pew check look to your left look to your right and say neighbor as for me and my row we will praise the Lord. And if they didn't say nothing, tell them, you're dismissed. You can go. You can go. I'm going to give you about 15 seconds before I even give you reason to give them glory. I'm going to give you 15 seconds before I raise my voice to see if you'll raise yours. I'm going to give you 15 seconds right now to open up your mouth and give your God. Because what I want you to do is why I'm talking now, a lot of them ain't saying nothing, but when I get to the end and get to the good part, they're going to be shouting. Don't say, if you don't shout now, don't be trying to shout later. If, if you're going to be my neighbor and you ain't going to talk to me now, don't try to talk to me later when I get these blessings. Back then, you didn't want me. Don't try to be up when I get hot. You're going to be all over you. Better. <laughs> Jacob lived 147 years. Abraham lived 175. I'm about to help somebody. But Isaac lived 180. Can I say that again? Jacob, 147. Abraham, 175. Isaac, 180. And ironically, Isaac lived the longest, but the Bible talks about him the least. Oh, y'all not going to get this. Genesis chapter 26 is the only chapter in the whole Bible dedicated to Isaac. It is the only chapter in the entire scripture uh, that's exclusively devoted to Isaac. He lived the longest, and yet the Bible says the least. We go chapter after chapter after chapter and hear nothing about this boy, and then we stumble up on chapter 26, and all of a sudden we find a chapter that is devoted to him. Can I help somebody? You may not be able to tell it yet because it's somebody else's turn. But the Lord sent me here to tell somebody, your chapter is about to open. Oh, I need somebody in here to help me. Touch somebody and say, baby, I promise you my chapter is coming. I promise you I will not be broke next month. I promise you I will not be single next year. I promise you I will not be depressed next summer. I promise you my high five three people say your chapter's coming. God's about to open up the windows of heaven and pour out on you a blessing you don't have room enough to receive. You're about to get blessings on blessings on blessings. You're about to find out that God has your name on his mind and you're getting ready to walk right into the center of your chapter. Somebody shout, I'm turning the page. Matter of fact, somebody shout, I'm next, I'm next, I'm next. I promise you, the next time you go out to that parking lot, it's going to be me with a paper tag. I'm next, I'm next. Matter of fact, I know, I, let me say it to this side over here. Slap somebody, tell them I'm now. 
I'm now. Matter of fact, I'm not next. I'm now. This is my month. This is my week. This is my day. This is my season. If you believe it, I dare you open up your mouth and shake the roof on this place. The reason why some of y'all ain't shouting because you ain't got the evidence. Don't you miss what I'm saying today. Don't wait until you get the evidence to act like you got it. You got to act like you got it so you can get it. Before this chapter starts, Isaac is actually given a clue by God that things are about to turn around. And I'm about to give you the hack. I'm about to give you the key. I'm about to give you the clue on how to know your season's about to change. But I'm just looking for the people I can say it to that won't. I don't feel like y'all ready yet. I'm, I'm still trying to find my click up in the house. I said, I'm looking to give you the direct thing to look at that will let you know that God is about to flip the script on your situation. Who want to know? Holler at your boy if you want to know. All right. You ready? There's a famine. You missed it. Not a husband. A famine. Not a pay increase on the job, but a famine. Not your student loans being forgiven, but a famine. Every time it dries up, the water's on the way. So what God does first is he causes a problem so he can be a solution. Because if you already have solutions, you won't need a savior. Is there anybody in the room that got a hell of a lot of problems in your life? It means God is about to give you some evidence. So I don't want you to shout because you got blessings. I want the people who got problems to make some noise. Oh, y'all didn't hear what I said. I want to find the people that if God don't do something in the next six days, somebody going to get smacked. If God don't do something in the next six days, you're going to tell that job where they can put it. If God don't do something in the next six days, you're going to drive past the house and not go back in the front door. I need people with problems to make some noise. The famine is the key. Now listen. If it wasn't for a famine, Ruth would have never gone into the field because Naomi would not have brought her away from the famine. And she met Boaz, not because she was cute, but because it was dry where she was. Oh, Y'all missing it, you're missing it. Somebody shout, it's the famine. It's the famine. If it was not for the famine, Elijah would not have gone to the widow's house. And if he had not gone to the widow's house, she would not have found out that a little oil can go a long way. There ought to be somebody in here that ought to be able to shout that when the famine came, you still can't figure out how you made it out. I wish I had about 300 people. You still can't figure out how you paid your rent after you lost it. You still can't figure out how you still got your mind after all. Can I find about 300 people that are starting to shout, thank God for the famine. High five three people say, thank God for the famine. It was good that I was afflicted that I might learn I'm glad they left me. I'm glad they broke my heart. I'm glad I lost the job. I'm glad they didn't hire me. I'm glad that my friend forsook me because it was in that moment that I realized that greater is he. That's how you know God is coming. 
because you're currently in a family. What do I mean? You, you, you go to work because you need to check, but you don't want to be there. I mean, some of y'all, it's, it's, it's Friday and you already regretting Monday. I know you can't say it because we stream these days and stuff get out on the internet, but anybody be on Sunday night just mad because you got to go deal with all them devils in the morning. You're in the famine. Somebody, you started a business and, and you thought by now that it would be popping and it ain't popping like you thought, but, but you're in a famine. You got that notepad on the nightstand with all of your visions in it, but ain't, it ain't happening like, like but, but you're just in a famine. And what God is letting you know is that that's how I start. That even if it ain't your chapter, you're still in the book. And I'm getting ready to finally reveal to you that the entire time you were right on the edge of evidence. That's why you can't quit now. That's why Noel Jones says you can't lose your mind over what you lost because you're going to need it for what God's about to say. Just touch somebody who look like they got the Holy Ghost and say, baby, I'm on the edge of evidence. Bro I'm, bro, I'm on the edge of evidence. I can Anybody feel that thing? Anybody feel like it's about, it got to change. It, it, it has to change. Anybody feel like it's your turn next? You've been watching and waiting and praying and fasting. It's about to happen. I decree and declare it's about to happen. Somebody who believes that you're on the edge of evidence, open up your mouth and give God. I'm sure just like you, when Isaac was at his daddy's funeral and the lawyer was reading the last will and testament and he said to Isaac, your father bequeaths you the land. Isaac looked at the land and said, I don't want that. It's dry. Who said that? It's dried. It's dried up. You can keep it. It ain't worth nothing. I'm sure it's messing with his confidence because he's got to be saying, why was it bountiful under my father? And now it's dry. What's wrong with my anointing? Why, 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 why did the church grow under that leader and now that I have it, it's stagnant? And, and, and what is God doing in between the edge and the evidence? I'm sure his, his confidence has to be in question. I'm sure he's frustrated because is there anybody here like me that will admit that sometimes you can be frustrated when you anticipated a thing and when you got it, it wasn't what you had in mind. Oh. Come on, y'all. Don't, don't get quiet on me. Slap your name. Ain't no future in your front. Uh, I mean, I mean have, you ever, have you ever wanted something and when you finally got it, it wasn't what? Anybody ever went to the mall and for shopping therapy, you put it on and it looked good in the store, but then when you get home and you put it on, all you can think about is, man, I needed that money for my. <laughs> Anybody ever bought a car that you just had to have and, and, and after you paid that high card note that you know you can't afford, too many times you're thinking of ways for it to get stolen by accident on purpose? <laughs> Don't act like you ain't ever thought, if I could just run it over the bridge and, and hop out and then go over the edge, I can tell the people something happened. <laughs> On the edge of evidence. And, and when I finally get my evidence, it ain't what I had in mind. I, I, I wanted to get married my whole life, but I, I didn't know that I had to be selfless. Oh, come on, talk to me. Yeah, I've been praying and asking God for a husband. I've been praying. I wanted my Boaz, but I didn't know that he didn't clean up after himself. I, I didn't know that, that he, was, he was toxic. I didn't know that he was always in his feelings. I didn't know he was a mama's boy. You knew. You just ignored it because you wanted the evidence. Have you ever anticipated something 
But when you got it, it wasn't what you expected. All his life, he knew that this land was his. He just didn't know it was going to be dry when he got it. He only had a plan for success. He didn't have a plan for failure. One thing I've learned is that you have to learn how to fail. I'm not saying become a failure. I'm saying that you got to keep your confidence even if it doesn't come out the way you expect it. I, I'm talking about coming to church and praising God whether the business is doing good or if it don't come. If it doesn't work, you come right in here and say, well, he must have something else for me. Come on, talk to me, somebody. But, but when I got it, it wasn't what I had in mind. And then Isaac, watch what he does. When he looks at the land, looks out, and he does what most of us do when we're confronted with unhappiness. He runs. How many people are guilty of running when it dries up? <laughs> as long as the milk and honey is flowing, it's heaven on earth. But when it dries up, I don't think this is what the Lord wants for me. As long as you got a solo in the choir, you love it. When somebody else sings your song, all of a sudden, the Lord is leading you. Oh, I got to talk about it to another place. You know, you'd be surprised at how many people God sent to a church until they're not looked at or appreciated. Then all of a sudden they get a revelation from God that they have to go because it's dried. You'd be surprised how many people in all of our churches say they want it to grow. But as long as their position stays, because God forbid God sends somebody else more qualified. Oh, let me move on. Then it, it, then, it, then it dries up. And we do what Isaac did when we're uncomfortable with the results that we didn't have in mind. We run. And he runs. And he leaves. And he does like many of us. He allows the situation to make a decision for him. It's, it's amazing today I watch the world. We make our decisions based on the outcome we had in mind. And if the outcome that we had in mind isn't the outcome that comes, then we say we're waiting on God, but we're actually waiting on God to agree with us. As opposed to saying like we used to say in the church, Lord, have. Are oh, y'all in here with me today? That there is something about our generation that is coming upon us where we're looking for God to serve us. And, and when we go to church, as opposed to going to church to be servants, we're looking for customer service. And, and we're looking for seats and we're looking for parking spots. But I grew up in a church will come what may. Whatever I got to do in the house of the Lord, I'd rather be a dork. I wish I had somebody. I, I, I know the church, I know we got LED screens now, and I know we got lights, but anybody remember the days when we had honor and respect and fidelity for the things of Christ? Can I say something and, and it don't hurt your feelings? The will of God is not determined by the outcome you had in mind. Help me, Holy Ghost. The will of God is determined by the sovereign plan of God. Before you were formed in your mother's womb, he had already called you as a prophet to the nations. You don't get to decide what God does with you. You get to decide if you're going to be obedient to the gift that he put inside of you. 
And I speak right now in this room that according to your obedience, God is about to stir up the gift. I need about 300 people to turn around in the circle and say, God, stir it up. That was one for the Father. Turn around in the circle again and say, stir it up. That was one for the Son. Turn around for the last time and say, stir it up. Now look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, you want to know why I keep turning around? Because every time I turn around, he keeps on blessing me. Some of you, there you go, there you go. You see how she turned around again? Because she believed it. Every time I turn around, he keeps on blessing me. I prophesy blessings in this room. I prophesy the windows of heaven opening and blessings that you don't have room enough to receive. And if your neighbor ain't shouting, tell them, God, give me their stuff. Give me the stuff of the person that won't shout for you. Give me a double portion. Now I need everything that has breath to praise. Open up your mouth and give them glory. Why you shouting? Let me tell you why some of them can't shout. Here's what Psalms 34, 19 says. Many are the afflictions of the righteous. And that's where we get stuck. We spend all our time in church rehearsing the afflictions. Oh, some of y'all right now, whether I'm preaching good or not, God is good enough for you still not to be sitting there looking at me like that. And he all right, I mean... He ain't saying nothing I ain't heard before. He good. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, and you get stuck. But my favorite part is the B part. But the Lord shall deliver them from them all. A thousand shall fall by your side. Ten thousand at your right hand, but none shall come not thee. I want to see the praise of people who understand that everything you've been worrying about, God's about to turn it around. Somebody shout, he's about to turn it around. Give your neighbor a high five and say, he's about to turn it around. I need about 500 of y'all to open up your mouth right now and begin to give God the praise. Give your neighbor a high five. And shout, neighbor, be not weary in well-doing, for you will reap a harvest if you faint not. Shout, yeah. I'm about to help somebody. I, I want you to be honest. How many runners do I have in the room? Like when stuff get... Like he don't like it, you, you, you like, you know what, man, I, I, I ain't. Come on, identify yourself. How many runners do I have in the room? See, I can't ask you. I got to ask the people you ran away from. I'm going to my mama house. I'll come down there and fight every one of y'all by myself. Y'all act like I ain't talking to you. I said, how many runners do I have in the house? Oh, they didn't speak to me at church. I'm going to another one. I, I ain't going to no church that ain't nice. I need my pastor to know me. Well, if you come often enough, where other place can you go once every other month and they know you? Y'all only got to say, man, I got a church, so even if you don't want me back, I can go preach somewhere else. He ran how many runners online? Watch this. He runs. And, and, and let me tell you where he runs. And God told him, watch what he said. He said, I know you're going to run. But whatever you do, don't go to Egypt. Don't go back to the place you ran from. Oh, y'all yeah, ain't going <laughs> to. Because every time we run, you go back to the thing you ran. He runs. God said, don't go, don't go to Egypt. Why would he want to go to Egypt? Because even though there's a famine in the land, Egypt has a river that doesn't dry up called the Nile. So he's running to the place that don't dry up even when it's dry.
But what he doesn't know is he's about to run past a fountain trying to get to a river. For there is a fountain. God, I wish I had a church in here today. And that fountain is filled with blood that flows from. Don't run past God trying to get to the river. Don't run to somebody else seeking something else. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all other things. Can I give you one more thing? The land, can we all agree that the land is dried up? Do you agree? All right. Can we all agree? Land is dry. Okay. The Bible said that. All right, so the land is dry. We all agree. Uh, the Bible says that the Philistines and other groups of people are in the land. They have been there for years through the famine. Pastor Mitch, back me up if I'm telling the truth. And they have been planting and nothing has grown. Why? Because there is a famine. But because he went where God told him to go. The Bible says that in the same land that nothing grew for them, he planted a seed and got a hundredfold. Watch this. In the same year. Can I preach in this place? You got so much anointing that things that don't grow for other people, God says they're about to start growing for you. And watch this. You are so anointed that you can plant in a desert and get a tree. Oh, I wish I had about 200 people that'll start praising God and just start saying, you know what? No weapon formed against me. Shall be if it dries up, I can still get a hundredfold. I prophesy a hundredfold blessing in this place today. I prophesy a hundred times the income. You don't know when to shout. I promise that God's gonna multiply your income 100 times. I want to see how you gonna act when a dollar turns into a hundred. Let me talk to, to the man of God who, who posted the thousand dollar offering. What do you do when God takes $1,000 and turns it into a $100,000? Because God is getting ready to give you a 100-fold blessing. And you're getting ready to sow in a place that doesn't work for anybody else. You know why? Because Isaac is the seed of Abraham. If he was just evidence of the loins of Abraham, we call that Ishmael. Ishmael is evidence, but Isaac is seed. And the one thing all seed needs is dirt. How many people in your life right now, everywhere you look is just barren and dry? Look at how smart God is. In the beginning, he creates man. From what? The dust of the ground. Now, if I were to take some dust and put it in front of your face right now and had you to breathe in, what would happen? You would sneeze. You know why? Because God creates you from dust and then makes you allergic to yourself. So you don't become full of yourself and you will know who it was. Oh God, I wish I had somebody. Just touch somebody and say, I got evidence. I got confidence. It might not be in the parking lot, but it's on the way. I might not live in the house of my dreams, but it's on the way. I might not have the spouse I've been looking for, but it's on the way. I need about 200 people to praise God in advance. That they did not bury you, they planted you. Every time they threw dirt on you, they were planting you. I need somebody to open up your mouth and start giving God the glory over the next 30 seconds. You're on the edge of evidence. And it don't look like it's about to happen. 
is because you're looking for green pastures. And God always starts with a family. Just, just when that thing starts drying up, God's like, you ready? Now we're about to show them that we don't need what they need to do what we do. God says he, he planted in a, in a famine in the same place people have been planting for years. They got nothing, and he got a hundredfold? Well, that's what happens when you're on the edge. Some of y'all don't even know it. You, you're, you're like. But if you give up and start backing down, you're getting away from the edge. That, that's why Paul said, I, I got to press toward the edge. I, I've got I've to gotta, I've gotta be there because that's where the, the blessing is. Don't get afraid of the edge. When you feel like almost giving up, that's exactly where you need to be. When you feel like all hope is gone. And that if God doesn't do anything in the next 24 hours, you may end it all. God says, that's where, that's where I need you because on the edge, you don't have your balance, so you got to lean on me. You, you got to trust me. Just high five somebody, tell them, trust them with the edge. Trust them. Trust them with the edge. Trust them. Trust them with the edge. Trust them with the edge. Trust them. Trust them with the edge. Trust them with the edge. Trust them. Trust them with the edge. Go to any court of law, they will tell you that there is a two to ten year fine and prison imprisonment for bearing evidence. If you want to get in trouble? Bury evidence. Anybody who bears evidence, they are treated as if they committed the crime. Can I tell you that for every person who has tried to bury you has a two to ten year sentence. You think that because nothing has happened yet, it's not going to happen. God, if his eye is on the sparrow, surely his eye is on you. And for everybody who betrayed you and tried to erase your name, the gavel is about to drop on you. Because God loves you so much that he will not let them get away with what they did trying to bury you. And here is the blessing. While they were burying you with lies, while they were burying you with deceit, and while they were burying you, here's a big one, with betrayal, what they didn't know is that you were a seed. And you can't bury a seed, but you can plant one. And I wanted to tell you, you're not being buried. God told me to tell you, you're being planted. Touch somebody say, plant me, plant me. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of the sinner, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and he doth meditate it on it day and night. And he is like a tree planted by the rivers of water. That word planted in the original language means transplanted, which means that it was picked up from where it was originally planted and put by the rivers of water. Transplanted. I 
decree and declare in this room that when things are drying up around you, the Lord will lift you and take you to the next watering place. I need somebody to stand up and start giving them glory. Come on, I need somebody to stand up and start giving them glory in this place. I need somebody to give them glory that everything is about to change in your life. Come on, come on, open up your mouth. Come on and give them worship in this place. Come on, don't panic, I say to worship him. They that worship him shall worship him in spirit and in truth. Open up your mouth and give him glory. Come on, bold conference. Come on and praise him. You're right on the edge of a miracle. You're right on the edge of a breakthrough. You're right on the edge of the next chapter of your life. Be not weary and well-doing, for you will reap a harvest if you faint not. 